Michael Barron. Originally from the northwest coast of Tasmania, a little town called Penguin. And that's where I became rather interested in the marine life to the boy. You're swimming around snorkeling, spear fishing, as you do when you're a kid. And from then now, all these years later, I now operate the Eagle Hawk Dive Centre on the Tasman Peninsula. We don't take anything these days, we just take photos these days. Dive Centre's been going since 1991, just over 20 years. Yeah, reflecting back when I was 10, 12 years old, just along that little coast area of Penguin, there was no problem at all making up a little hand sphere, as we did, swimming on the end of the rocks, you know, five, six metres deep, and coming home with cod, wrasse, blue throat. There was never a dive or never a little swim where I wouldn't come home with something. So that's a long time ago now. If I go back then now, I would be very lucky in those same places to probably even see some parrotfish. Because back then I remember the time when the giant kelp existed along some of those places and the water was nice and clear. There was a lot more. You could line fish and catch fish without a problem. Leather jacket, blue fray rat. But I'm afraid nowadays, two generations later, um, I think you find it to be a very, very different story. Well, I moved from the northwest coast to go to our uh, university here in 1973. So there was a little bunch of us, three or four guys, who got around together, go diving every weekend, catching crust. That was the reason you'd go for a dive, or pick up a few abalone, whatever. So we'd track around Bruny Island, the peninsula here, up the east coast, northeast coast, the whole, the whole area. Mainly off the shore, we didn't have boats. We didn't have the money. So it was all done off the shore. And in many places, there wasn't a problem in catching your five, or at that stage, in those early days, it was 10 craze on the boat. Right? So it wasn't really a problem catching your five or whatever in, in a day. We've been operating this dive centre, as I say, since 1991. 20 to 25 years ago, with a decent boat, you could go somewhere up the coast or down the coast from Pirate Bay and get your five coca in a dive without any real problem. But I'll put the challenge out now to anybody that can do that right now, out of Pirates Bay, 10 kilometres, 12 kilometres to the north or south, in one dive to catch what even is now three quite three quotes for the quota. I don't believe that if you, unless you're exceptionally lucky, exceptionally lucky, to be able to catch five crays in one dive along this coast. Going back to the early days, again it was a lot of you know, spear fishing from the shore, hand spearing. We never, we never took anything, it was a principle amongst our little group of guys. We never speared anything while carrying compressed air, scuba. Mm -hmm. That was just a principle we adopted all those years ago. So any of the fish we took, other than crows of course, was done on breath hole diving. And we used to take part in uh, competitions. Um, every number of years, every seven years, there was a Australian Underwater Federation we would have competitions between the states and every seven years it would be Tasmania's turn. So I remember the time, for example, up off Bridport, up off uh, Crockett's Point. The first time we ever dived in a competition would have been 1970 and there was no actual uh, quota like numbers per species, it was the largest weight would win. And the local guy, of course, won it that year. He bagged many, many kilos of parrotfish. From then on, they changed the rules because it could have obvious reasons. So from then on, it was a case of one specimen per species which would, would, would be weighed in. So, again, going back to those days, you know, it was, it's been a total change. I mean, 40 years, a total change in, in the uh, abundance of pretty well all species. Even Jack Mackerel. Jack Mackerel's an interesting one, a pelagic animal. Uh, 10 to 15 years ago, swimming down around here, in the cooler climates, say 14 degrees, the April through to winter time, the early part of winter, autumn, winter. It was not uncommon to see these massive schools of, of Jack Mackerel compounds. I cannot say now I've seen Jack Mackerel for at least 10 years. That's climatic changes, big picture changes. Another massive change, of course, 
don't know if you're into the marine scene at all, the biggest uh, immediate change in our ecosystem here is the disappearance of the giant kelp. Now, the giant kelp, this massive stuff that grows from down from 25 metres to the surface. Um, going back to those years up on the northwest coast in the early 70s, that macrocystis was there. Again, affording um, protection for the various animals, uh, habitat for perilous larvae of the craze to settle on, protection for the little juveniles. Now, over that period of time, this disappeared, it's, it's gradually disappeared down the east coast of Tasmania. Bishanoe disappeared 20 years ago, and we've just lost, in this last 10 years, we've pretty well lost all our forests. Um, it's, a, it's a dramatic change to our ecosystem. There's nowhere now for the perilous larvae to settle. The, the, uh, the humongous surface area that those massive forests used to uh, give these many, many different species has gone. A lot of great fishermen used to say, oh, it's great now we can put our pots where we couldn't put them before. But in the big picture, it's, it's, the ecosystem has gone through a, a radical, radical change in the last 20 to 30 years. The heaviest pressure is initially is, is the numbers of extractors. I mean, uh, say in the last 20 years, or even 10 years, well, I, know for a number, I, know, I know the numbers to quote here. I know that in 1996-97, this is just rock lobster alone. The number of rock lobster licenses, that included divers, pots, rings, the whole lot. The official figure was 8,000 licenses. In 2007, just over 10 years later, that figure was 21,000 licenses. Just for crust. So the effort has tripled, effectively. But not only tripled in numbers, what we're talking here is a massive increase in technology from the mid to late 90s through to the 07, 08 year, where boats, like our boat, 20 foot shark hat, was considered quite a reasonable size boat in 1991. Now at Eagle Hawk Neck Jetty, that boat is a very average size boat. You know? And not only are the vessels bigger, therefore go, go further, they carry more people, they carry more gear, the whole bit. But the other revolutionary change in the last 15 years has been GPS. You can locate that rock in the middle of the ocean every day to the metre. So not only has the effort gone up three times, the massive change in the quality of gear has revolutionised the recreational sector. So, you know, ballpark figures in not just triple, there's probably gone up five or six times in the actual capability of the extraction effort. So, initially it's the effort, way too much for my opinion to, for the stocks to be, and it's not only crayfish and diving and the fishing and all that, there's nets, all that sort of stuff, the net numbers have gone up, all that retained. So, the, the actual extractive power, if you want to put it, of, of the fishermen, recreational fishermen, has, has, has had a major impact, major impact on the stocks. And then now we're overlaying that with environmental changes, and we all know that, you know, well, if you believe it, of course, you know, environment and climate change. We, the, the, the big forest on the east coast the Tassie has disappeared, the primary reason for its disappearance is the nutrient poor strengthening East Australian current. It's pushing south faster and longer. We're now not getting the cold water, nutrient rich southerly water across the bottom of Tassie coming up the east coast in the winter and pushing, it used to go up to Victoria. So we're not now getting that nutrient rich water, oxygen rich water, all that. So the macrocystis has disappeared. And, the, and of course, say for example, the crayfish larvae are not coming, uh, enabling to get back up the coast either. So all those factors, as I said before, is um, radically changing the marine ecosystem on this east coast of Tassie. The water here where we dive, uh, the Tasman Sea, 
the audit temperatures are changing, proven by CSIRO research, up to four times the global average. And that in itself is going to have a major impact on our marine system. Somebody's going to make some very, very radical and hard decisions. You're never going to please everybody, and there's going to be a lot of upset people if you put in place what I believe would be a means to help to rejuvenate the system. Now we're talking about cutting back on effort, be it number of nets, be it number of pots, whatever. The idea of reducing the cray quota from five to three to save and help the fishery is a total fit because the average number, the average number of craves per pot is less than one anyway. So that's just a total furphy, it's a, you know, make you feel good move. So that's not changing the effort as far as the stock goes. One I other. So the only ways to, to help to, for the place to rejuvenate is, in my opinion, is total no-take, closed areas, to allow the animals to have a chance. Because if they don't have a chance, which they don't at the moment, because everywhere is effectively available to take. Only the only other day, last, last weekend, I went around the point of Eagle Hawk Neck, there were five recreational nets right on that point. So, you know, <laughs> well, good luck to them if they can catch something, but yeah, whereas you talk to people that have been using the gear you know, 30 years ago, it's a generational baseline change. You know, the, other, the other classic, the classic comparison from a generational basically sliding baseline perspective is when they take these divers out, the new divers, and I'll say to the instructor who's probably been in the water for 20 or 30 years or whatever, so just out of interest, Bob, <laughs> to pick a name, on, this, on the dive, mate, just, just keep your eye open if you see any, any craze, just have an idea. And the guy will come back and he had to get on, mate. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw a couple, yeah, two or three, you know, in, you know, 45 minutes on the bottom. And the student will come back out, all excited that he's seen two or three craze. All excited that he's seen two or three craze. Now, going back 25 years ago, if, you know, you didn't see more than you know, 20, 30 craves in a dive, I think we're getting pretty bad. But now it's, it's just, yeah, well, what do you say? Well, the basis of anything is knowledge, I guess. I mean, the more you understand and the more, the more you can appreciate, A, why it's happened, and B, attempt to even think about trying to improve it. Because, I mean, the next generation, our kids, you know, the young ones coming through now, they think it's normal to swim around and might see two or three trays. But it's far from normal. Far from normal. And the only way you can get a normality in a situation is, like up on the Mariah Island, is to actually close the area for no take. Um, how do we do it ourselves? Real education is the name of the game. Get to the young ones. Let them, let the young ones try to get the young ones to appreciate how it should be. How it should be. Because at the moment they have no idea. They just think it's normal to see a fish, two fish swimming around, say, in Fortescue Bay, jump off the beach and say, that's sort of parrotfish. But going back 25, 30 years ago, you'd have boarfish, you'd have cod, you'd have you know, many dozens of parrotfish swimming around. So that's, that's the bottom line. I mean, I don't think it, you won't change the, um, the present parental generation, because that's, mind, that's their mindset. But to try to get through the young ones, that uh, things could be a lot, lot better if, if the place was uh, much more highly protected.